I was about f five or six years old when my parents first took me to the Natural History Museum in London. And I remember, like any kid, being dragged into the museum. I don't want to go. I don't want to be in a boring museum. And I remember dragged in through the door, and suddenly I was faced with this vast dinosaur. I was looking at it going, ooh. <laughs> and it was, I still remember. I can still remember exactly that moment. And I looked at this huge Diplodocus. It was the Carnegie Diplodocus, which had been donated to the Natural History Museum. And from that moment on, I was hooked on dinosaurs. But that was when we lived near London and we moved down to the southwest of England and when I was about six or seven years old. And in my garden, I started finding fossils. And if you hear something, you might forget it, as the old proverb say. And if you see something, you might know it. But by actually doing, you can really understand. And by actually finding fossils in my dad's garden, I was beginning to understand more and more about the history of life on Earth and I was completely hooked. I think it's every paleontologist's dream to work on a fossil which has that little bit of extra information. And when one of my students who was doing her masters with me had spent the summer digging with Tyler, she came back with this wonderful story of a dinosaur with skin impressions, or so they thought at the time. And I drove out, well flew, then drove up to North Dakota to see this fossil for myself. And it was then I realized this was a remarkable fossil that I had to work on. I, I have to admit, the first time that Tyler brought me to the mummy site in North Dakota, and we'd driven across the Badlands in this battered, noisy old Ford pickup. And you, you arrive at the site, and when the engine is turned off, and you're greeted with absolute silence. It's beautiful. And then the smell of the sagebrush hits you, and then you're very aware where you're putting every single foot on the ground and trying to make as much noise as possible because you're invading where wildlife lives. You're the invader. <laughs> and I remember the first time we went to the site, this vast rattlesnake <laughs> was, was sat there going, oh, and it disappeared off, of course, because they're more frightened of you than we are of them, probably. But we're very grateful when such creatures leave dig sites because again, it's one of the hazards of being in the field. The thing with the dinosaur mummy, it opens up a whole new area of research for paleontology, because it's like filling in the gaps which we've been missing for so many years when you're trying to reconstruct skeletons into living animals. When you have a skin covering, for instance, it helps constrain the volume of muscle groups, for instance, which are critical when you're trying to calculate how fast a dinosaur will go. Now, in the past, we've had to guess where these muscles fit, how big they are. Whereas when you've got a skin envelope, which sort of fits over the tail, and you know how big the muscle groups are, which is like the main engine of the dinosaur, it's, it's so important when you're doing locomotion studies. And Dr. Bill Sellers, who I work with at the University of Manchester, he's made it an art form of making dinosaurs walk using his high-powered computers, which have enabled us to basically make this hadrosaur run at something like 28 miles per hour, based upon the evidence we can extract from this remarkable fossil. What we've tried to do with this study is introduce new technologies to paleontology, because paleontology is often perceived as a group of guys in a hole covered in dirt, digging the bones out. And what we're showing with this research, and there's many research programs like this across the world, but we're applying state-of-the-art technology and we're trying to use techniques which are traditionally not used in paleontology because that's when you can really start that steep learning curve discovering totally new things to science. That's what excites me. North Dakota today is beautiful. I love the Badlands. He's weathering Hell Creek formation with the sort of classic uh, sand and muddy buttes which weather away to reveal these beautiful dinosaur bones. And it can be quite a harsh climate today in North Dakota, from the harsh winters to the really hot summers. However, back in the times when the Hell Creek Formation was sp still being deposited, it was a very, very different place. It was closer to the equator then. It was a very tropical environment. Not much grass around. There is evidence now that grass had actually evolved by the end of the Cretaceous. But the dominant types of plants, which there have been plenty of them, would have been cycads, ferns, 
palms, and some broadleaf plants, flowering plants like magnolias, for instance. It would have been quite a dense forested area on a floodplain, which regularly this huge river which was meandering across this floodplain might have burst its banks due to seasonal floods and so on. And as a result, any animals on this floodplain would have actually been carried and buried within these floodwaters. So it was a very, very different place to what it is today. Being in the field is a bit like boot camp, paleo boot camp. You, you can actually start at five o'clock in the morning, so if you're especially in a really hot climate because you want to avoid the heat of the day because at midday you want to be out of the sun, uh, unless you're English, of course, because any mad dogs and Englishmen go running around in the midday sun. I do. Um, it might account for my behaviour sometimes. But in terms of the actual harsh reality of being in the field, you've got to be very aware of the issues of the locality where you're working whether it be rattlesnakes, or whether it be rock falls, or just general health and safety in the field, it's, it's something which you have to keep always in your mind, especially when you've got a big team, a crew of people working. Um, during the excavations I've been doing in northern Spain, for instance, many of the rock faces we've been working on and LIDAR scanning, they're vertical and you're dealing with quite severe rock falls sometimes. And if you're at the bottom of this vertical slope, which you're mapping, and you've got a few tons of rubble coming towards you, it can make life very entertaining. So it's, it sounds very romantic, but it's not. It's actually quite harsh. The reality of it is it's very, very hard work. I, one thing it does keep me is fit, because to get into the field each year is very, very physically hard work. So, and that's something I enjoy about it as well. I don't work for a living, I live for work. I'm very lucky doing what I do, and there are millions of kids out there who wanted to be dinosaur hunters, and I was one of them. And everyone asked me, why did you become a fossil hunter? Because I'm passionate about paleo. I think it's one of the most wonderful stories on the planet. That's why I became a paleontologist. But how I fit all the different facets of my life into sort of one chunk, means sometimes you do end up working 18, 20 hour days, seven days a week, but I wouldn't do it if I didn't love it. Um, I do a lot of work at the Manchester Museum, at the University of Manchester, where I do uh, quite a lot of public lectures and outreach programs, sort of promoting science to as wide an audience as possible. And I also teach vertebrate paleontology and evolution and various other courses uh, for the undergraduate program at the University of Manchester. So that's quite a big portion from June until well, from January till June each year. However, from June until December is when I bury myself into research and field work. And I can be in the field for up to three or maybe even four months in a year. And we have projects running in Northern Spain, in Catalonia. We have projects running in North America. We have other sites which we're looking to work on in uh, China, which we're hoping to collaborate on in the future. And we also have projects which we're looking to collaborate with folks in Argentina as well. So it makes life very, very busy, but what a ride. <laughs>